Uh, thank you so much, and, and thank you to uh, Columbia and the program for uh, inviting me to come over here from, uh, from Pittsburgh to talk with you today. Um, so I think perhaps my talk is going to end up being at the highest level. It's going to be touching on a lot of different subjects. Uh, as, as Christopher mentioned, um, I am both in philosophy and psychology and tend not to draw a distinction between the two much to the consternation of my colleagues in each department. Um, but I think what I'm going to be trying to do today is, is talk a bit about the role of prediction, perhaps in, in a kind of cognition, in areas of cognition where it doesn't get talked about as much. Um, so I think when we think about the role of prediction in cognition, we can think about um, there's a kind of classic philosophical distinction that gets brought up about the directions of fit when it comes to the mind-world relations. Um, I'm going to recast the classic philosophical distinction a little bit that I think you can think of learning as essentially fundamentally a process of normally trying to fit your mind to the world, right? So the world has some structure, it has some content to it, and what you do when you learn is you try and get your mind to, in some sense, be like the world. Uh, you're trying to reduce the differences between your representations, your models of the world, and the actual world itself, in some sense. I'm being very hand wavy here, it's okay, hopefully. Um, in the other direction, there's action and reasoning, which tend to be trying to get the world to fit your mind. So I've got a set of desires, and I try and change the world so as to satisfy those desires, that I want to reduce the differences between my preferences and the state of the world. And of course, I might fail. I might have the desire to teleport, and the world confounds those desires and makes it impossible to, to eliminate the difference. But nonetheless, we've got to try a process whereby I hold the mind fixed, and I alter the world to try and get it closer. And I think um, one of the things that I think has really uh, come out in the sort of prediction coding, some of the work that, for example, I'm, I'm guessing Professor Friston's going to be speaking about momentarily, is that one way to think about this intuitive notion of differences, reducing differences, is in the idea of reducing prediction errors and trying to reduce the difference between what I think is going to happen and what does happen. Or get the world so that it conforms to my predictions of what I want to have happen. Now, one of the things that I think is talked about perhaps a bit less is the fact that predictions and errors are always goal relative in certain ways. There's, in fact, I want to suggest no notion of prediction unless it's prediction for a purpose, prediction relative to a standard, that those simply give us something about a notion of goals. We have to say what we are trying to predict. And that then also determines what even counts as an error. So if I'm trying to um, uh, if I'm trying to locate my position sufficiently for somebody who wanted to come to this talk, if all I said was I'm going to be in New York City, that's not very helpful. If I'm trying to locate my position for there, there's a very large error there potentially. If I'm trying to locate my position for my colleagues who uh, are trying to get in touch with me because there's a problem I have to deal with as department head, I can say I'm in New York City, and that has a very low error. That same assertion has low error relative to them because that's good enough for the goal they have, which is to figure out whether they can have a face-to-face -face meeting with me today. Now, goals are, in at least cognitive psychology, cognitive science generally, widely recognized that, of course, they matter for reasoning and action. Right? So we had these two directions of fit. There's the reasoning and action side, and I think everyone sort of realized, of course, goals matter for that. What I think is much less common is to recognize the role of goals in learning, at least in any substantive way. I think if you, um, instead, what typically happens is that goals are viewed as important only in as much as they kind of pick out the domain. So if you want to learn French, then you need to pay attention to the sounds uttered by a French speaker or to the words in a textbook, rather than say the color of the shirt that somebody is, that that French speaker is wearing. Right, so there's, I want to suggest a kind of somewhat surprising gap here, that on the one hand, both directions of fit require notions of prediction, require notions of prediction error, but yet the goal relativity only seems to be coming in on one side. And I want to suggest that it's actually very important to think about the goal relativity of learning. Um, so I think if you look, certainly in cognitive science, as a kind of standard view, and I think this extends to a lot of the views of, the views of many philosophers, philosophers of mind, philosophers of psychology, which is that learning is about giving you veridical representations. Learning is about getting a model of the world that tracks the world in some truth-like way, speaking in sort of philosopher speak. That is to say that the learning should basically um, output, you know, the content of the environment around me. That it's, I'm making an error in learning, for example, if I think that there's two people in this room. 
right? Because I'm not mirroring the world appropriately in some way. I don't have a veridical representation. Um, now, if you have this view, then goals are going to matter really in just in ter terms of determining what counts as the relevant parts of the environment, nothing really more. And then I think that this fits very naturally with this, the two directions of fit, right? So the picture becomes exactly the sort of picture I, I sketched with that first slide. Learning is about adjusting my mind to fit the world. Reasoning and action are about using those to achieve my ends, my goals. Goals are about value, values about preferences and desires, right? So I think that it's a very natural way to think that goals don't matter for learning, or at least don't matter in any direct way. But I want to argue that's wrong. That in fact, um, learning is not about mirroring the world. It's not about having vertical representations. Learning is about achieving your goals. That in fact, the goal-centric nature uh, percolates all the way into learning. It isn't that you learn in a goal-free way and then apply in a goal-based way, but rather that goals matter all throughout the process. And I want to sort of, sometimes this gets, I, I confess when I've raised these ideas before with people, um, they tend to either think that it's trivial or ludicrous. So um, for those of you who think it's trivial, let me just suggest pick up any current issue of a major cognitive psychological journal that has a paper on learning, and almost certainly goals are not discussed in any substantive way in that paper. So if you think that it's, uh, that it's trivial, that, well, of course goals matter in, in learning, let me suggest to you at least that's not the way that, that's not the state of the science, I would argue. If you think that um, it's insane, I would suggest that in fact perception, the, the history of what we know from perception over the last uh, 15, 20 years has exactly been a shift away from the idea that perception is about giving us veridical representations of the world. We now take it as just, of course, perception is about, for example, um, that you don't necessarily represent things in the periphery of your vision, uh, uh, of your visual field. Instead, you essentially represent pointers, that if you need that information, so I don't remember the color of the dress that Melinda's wearing, but I can find it out. I know that that information is available there in my visual field, and I'm trying not to look at her, because that would ruin the example, right? And what's interesting is that you then get a very natural idea, which is that perhaps sometimes it's rational, normatively defensible, to learn things that are false, right? That if learning is about achieving your goals, well, if achieving your goals is best achieved by learning something false, then that's what you ought to do. And so I'm going to hopefully have time to come back and briefly touch on that uh, in, in, a, in a few minutes. So the idea really here, if you want a slogan, is cognition is goal satisfaction, not as mirror and reason, or mirroring an inference engine. That cognition is through and through, I want to suggest, about achieving goals, um, where goals then, of course, feed directly into the ideas of prediction errors. Um, so as part of this work, we've, uh, I've been working with some students on this, and, and one of the things we developed is a, a pretty precise normative computational model of the role of goals on learning that lets us talk about what's rational to do given a set of goals in an environment, uh, what, what ought you learn. Um, I thought about putting up a lot of math and realized that it's, you know, a Monday afternoon, everyone's eyes would glaze over, uh, and so I'm not going to do that to you. I'll just assert, but I'm happy to, to talk about it if people want, that what, it, what we get out of the model is basically a picture in which um, learning becomes about figuring out what differences make a difference. And so you naturally end up uh, not having any sort of normative reason to learn the truth. You just have a normative reason to get some representation that enables you to do the right thing. And once you do that, you discover that there are many external reasons, reasons that might have to do with the nature of our cognition, with the accidents of our personal histories, uh, the analogies that spring to mind, that in fact are entirely rational grounds for having belief that as long as they enable successful action, uh, are entirely rationally defensible. So let me give a kind of example of, uh, so that's the normative model. We've also looked at it descriptively. So let me uh, give you a kind of example, try and get some audience participation. So here's a kind of example experiment that we've been running. Um, so th the idea is you're gonna get presented with four buttons. You press the buttons, that they give numbers, okay? Um, we put various cover stories on, these are the levels of some chemical in cells that you're measuring, you know, the standard ideas of just give a, a, a fake, relatively blank cover story. Um, and what we're gonna do is everybody in the experiment is actually gonna see exactly the same information. 
We don't vary the information at all between people. What we vary is what they believe or understand to be the nature of goal relevance, what things might or might not be goal relevant. So for example, we might vary one sentence in the cover story, which is what you think you're gonna be tested on at the end. Are you gonna be tested on which button produces the largest number on average, the smallest number on average? Are you gonna be tested on can you report all of the average numbers? And then what we do is we look for failures to learn. Because if your learning should be guided by your goals, then we should find that you fail to learn certain kinds of things that you could otherwise have learned. So let me, uh, here's the audience participation part. So uh, the right hand side, audience right, um, you're gonna have the goal of figuring out uh, which button uh, on average leads to the largest value. Um, audience left, you get the smallest, okay? So it'll be very quick, I promise. So, uh, sorry, S is uh, for subjects. The subjects in the experiment, I apologize. Um, okay, ready? Okay. We give the subjects 10 trials so they get a bit more, but that's about, that's about the pace actually. We slow it down a bit even for them. All right, so um, audience right, I gave you the goal of the maps, correct? Okay, um, which button had the smallest value on average? C, C probably, all right. Um, those of you who had the minimum goal, which one was it? It was C, yeah. Um, which one had the biggest over here? Don't know, don't care. Um, in fact, if you care, those, were the, those are the actual averages um, over, over the course of it. So um, good job, you got it right. Good job, everyone. Um, so you might ask, well, what do people do when you give them, say, a sequence of, of 10 of these kinds of trials? Well, the first thing we can ask is we can ask, um, everybody figures out, you know, two of them are relevant to their goal and two of them are not. That, that's the really easy part. So we just, one thing we did is we just said binary force choice, which one's bigger or smaller? Can people figure it out? But then we surprise them and ask them the binary force choice for the non-goal relevant buttons. So unsurprisingly, um, for people who had to figure out what the true averages were. I'm just gonna show the bars, they're less interesting. Um, go figure, everybody figures it out. It's actually not a very hard task. Um, the, the interesting one is what they do with the goal irrelevant. And they're not statistically distinguishable from chance. Um, which is to say that although they see 10 trials, they don't figure out, they don't learn which of the others is, which of them is either bigger or smaller. They don't get the rank order, essentially. And then we ask them to actually estimate the button values, um, and we get exactly the pattern you would expect. For the goal-relevant ones, the tall bars for max and the short bars for min, you get a significant difference between the judgments. For the goal-irrelevant, that is the low bars for max and the tall bars for min, no statistically significant difference between them. People just don't learn about the ones that they perceive to be goal-irrelevant. Um, I'll just mention the average is in there as a control condition. Those people learn everything. So this is a learnable task. It's not like you, people can't do it, they just don't. So we've done a whole bunch of experiments, I'm not gonna bore you with more of them and I only get you know, 20 minutes, so I better not. Um, but one of the things that we did, so for example, I'll just summarize some of the results. So one of the things we did is in fact, instead of doing the four simultaneously, we presented them sequentially. So you see all 10 for one button, then all 10 for another button. And you might think in this condition, there's nothing else for these people to look at. I mean, they can stare around on the screen, you know, stare around the room, but that's the only thing on the screen. Of course they're gonna learn. No difference from these results. If you're in the max condition, those low number bars, those no lo low number buttons, even though you have to sit there and see 10 of them with nothing else on the screen, you do not distinguish between them statistically. You can't, on average, these people are not able, do not distinguish between them. They're a chance in the forced choice, okay? Um, so you might wonder why this happens. We've done some follow-up experiments and uh, there's clear evidence of significant changes in attention allocation. So eye tracking changes rather significantly over the course of it. Um, interestingly, people don't seem to change how they think about the problem. What they change, you might think of it, at least our best model, is that what's happening is that the dynamic adjustment of your learning in response to goals is being driven by um, what you let into the system, not what the system does once it gets in. So I'd be curious how this might fit with some of the things that, that you may be talking about, Carl. Um, and of course, I wanna be clear, people use all kinds of evidence for this. So you actually don't have to tell people a goal. If they know that they're in an experiment, they assume that their goal is to be able to do whatever the training task is. So you give them a training task and they assume that that's what they're going to be doing for the test task, uh, even if it's not. 
Um, now, I earlier claimed not only, now these, these cases are a little bit easy, right? People are just ignoring certain information. I earlier claimed that people correctly learn falsehoods. Let me just give two quick examples of that. Um, one is that, in fact, you find uh, what we've referred to as action enhancing distortions. So suppose you have to make a forced choice between using one of two chemicals in your garden. You think they're both fertilizers. That, in fact, it's rational for you to believe, for you to learn, in some sense, that the weak fertilizer, the one that's not as good, is actually a poison. That would be a rational thing for you to do, even though it's clearly false. Why rational? Because it increases the probability, given that we know that choice is a, is a probabilistic endeavor in humans, right? So if you have two options that vary on, you know, in terms of how effective they are, people probabilistically choose the stronger one. They don't always choose the stronger one. So what this suggests is that, in fact, um, it's advantageous to skew what you believe about the weaker one in fact, even to the negative side. And we have uh, the citation there, but we've, we've done several experiments where you exactly find this, um, that if you, put, if you just tell people to learn causal strength, they do it fine. If you tell them they're gonna make a choice, you get systematic distortions of what they learn. Um, and I would suggest this is actually directly analogous to what you see in uh, categorical perception. Uh, think of the classic LR distinction where you get a distortion of the perception of the sound wave uh, if you are somebody who was raised in a language that has L and R as distinct phonemes as opposed to others. Or the Arabic, um, for those of you who might struggle with these, there's the Arabic, uh, the two Gs, the G and G, which an Arabic speaker, if I did those right, would say, oh, of course those are different. Most, for example, native English speakers don't hear them as dramatically different. We lack that, uh, that effect. Um, another example that you see in terms of correct learning of falsehoods has to do with uh, the ways in which we map new knowledge onto old, in which we try to get our knowledge to conform to our prior beliefs. So for example, um, heart size and heart failure, most people, if you ask them, uh, so, so there's two hypotheses that you might have. One is that uh, a heart growing larger causes it to be weaker. Another is a heart growing weaker causes it to be larger. Okay, so I'll let you in your own mind imagine which one you think is more plausible. Um, in fact, the true answer is that the heart getting weaker causes it to get bigger, which is backwards from what most people think. And in fact, uh, there are, were medical textbooks in the 1980s that gave the wrong causal direction, even though it was well known. And a natural explanation for it is, well, the heart getting bigger becoming weaker fits with our prior knowledge, the heart as a muscle. As muscles get bigger and flabbier, they get you know, weaker. And so it's a very natural analogy to use. It's a very natural story to have. It turns out it just happens to be exactly backwards in terms of the causal order. Now, how does that connect here? Well, it, certainly in the 1980s, doctors had no way to intervene on either one. So there was no reason for them to care about the causal direction. It didn't matter for the goals of diagnosis. It didn't matter for the goals of treatment. So for the goals the doctors had, all that mattered was that they were able to use one to predict the other. That just requires correlation, not causation. So why not have the causal belief that fits with all of your other prior knowledge? It's easier, it's more likely to be retained. You can deploy it faster. It's a case where I think, in fact, you've got a natural story to be told that the doctors were entirely correct and rational in believing something false because for their goals, it was sufficient. Now, this idea of valuable falsehoods, I, I mean, I am a philosopher, so I need to make sure to recognize, this is not a new idea. I'm not uh, in any way claiming credit. I mean, I think um, here's one classic statement. If you look uh, in, in Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, um, you know, the falseness of a judgment is not necessarily an objection. The question is to what extent it is life-promoting. Or if you think about uh, somebody who's uh, quite familiar to people here in Columbia, John Dewey, um, uh, knowledge requires solutions to a problem. Inquiry for Dewey was always relative to a situation. Situation is not merely a description, but in fact includes information about my own values, my own goals, my own interests. Or um, I couldn't find a nice quote for Dewey, so I apologize, I don't have a pithy one there. Uh, or William James, um, his uh, counterpart, far worse, of course, up the road in Harvard. Um, the true is the name for whatever proves itself to be good. Right? That, that truth is about having success. Right? Now, you might object that all of this is um, just an accident of our cognition. Right. So perhaps this goal relativity is just kind of local. Over time, we get closer to truth. Learning gets us closer to the truth. Um, that eventually we do start to get representations that mirror. You might think, 
well, yeah, I mean, I, I learned for this goal, I learned for that goal, right? So you learned the max. Then if you learned again for min, now you're going to know everything, right? Now you're going to be able to mirror. That this would be the idea that truth is always the best predictor in the long run. Um, I think that that's wrong, okay? Uh, now, uh, if I had a bit more time, I'd go into this, but I will skip over it. But um, the short version is I think the best place to look for this actually is to look at science. Because I think if there's any place where uh, this idea of truth as, as the best predictor, truth, uh, the mirroring idea, uh, or a universal epistemic goal, we ought to find it in science. Um, and the problem, in fact, is that uh, often it is the case that there is no truth that is always the best, even in scientific cases. That goal relativity, uh, and here I'll just make this, con con uh, this claim, that there are both empirical and theoretical grounds and evidence that in fact, um, goal relativity is not an accident of our cognition. It's in fact something that is inherent in all inquiry. Um, let me see if I can figure out how to jump over it. So I won't, I have a case study here, but I'm gonna jump over the case study in the interest of time. Um, maybe I will? No, it's not gonna let me. So I'm just gonna quickly, uh, this is a case study that we did looking at um, things like El Nino and showing that empirically the goals that you have uh, change how you, which theories are the best in a rather, writ, uh, rather deep way. Um, so we have empirical reasons to think that there's something, uh, that there is no truth that is ultimately the best predictor. It depends on what you want to predict. We also have a lot of uh, theoretical evidence for this as well. So, uh, you know, in a high sort of high level conclusion, um, I think what I, you know, prediction error being goal relative, I take that to be relatively, hopefully innocuous um, or un unsurprising, uncontroversial. The thing is that leads to the idea that in fact, that goals should matter for learning. Um, and I think that we have a lot of evidence now for this, that goals do matter deeply for our own learning. It's not just on the reasoning side. Um, and so the moral I would say is that learning is for purposes, not just to mirror. So this picture of learning as, uh, just trying to fit your mind to the world is a mistake. You're already trying to fit the world to your mind when you're learning, or you're thinking about how you're going to want to fit the world to your mind when you're doing the learning in the first place. So, thank you.